Episode 11, The Paradox. Welcome to The Paradox with your attending, Dr. Eric Larson. He is a practicing anesthesiologist and clinical assistant professor at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. Listen in as he takes you behind the scenes of what practicing medicine in today's ever-changing world is like with another doctor. The Paradox is a fun and accidentally informative show for physicians, patients, or anyone who has ever found themselves in a waiting room. Welcome, I'm your host, Dr. Eric Larson. This is The Paradox, if you're here for a first time. Thank you so much for joining me. I think you'll learn some interesting things today. Also, I encourage you to go back and listen to some past episodes, always new topics on medicine. And thank you, friend, who sent this podcast your way. Or if you just stumbled upon it, it's your good fortune and mine as well. If you're a returning listener, thank you so much again for coming back and then also for sharing the show with your friends and colleagues and family. If you're a physician, this is a great way to share the show to, with your friends and people who are maybe medically uh, oriented or interested in what's going on. It's a great way of showing them what's going on in the trenches of medicine without getting too technical. I expect that physicians will learn things, but also people, lay people and people who are associated in the healthcare field, which are not physicians, for instance, nurses and other personnel. As always, go to the Patreon page at patreon.com slash the paradox. That's paradox spelled with a D-O-C-S. There you can sign up to be a patron supporter of the show. Every dollar raised goes towards the production and promotion of the show. Uh, you'll have access to bonus content as I produce more of it. Uh, you'll have my advertisement, which is running in Phoenix, Arizona, thanks to my cousin. And I'd also encourage you to visit the website at theparadox.com, where you can find show notes and obviously links to things that we talk about during the show. But also you can sign up for the email list. There's also now a YouTube channel. I am also on Facebook and Twitter. So there's no excuse for seeing my face and finding out more of the show and ways of spreading the show. Today's episode is an interesting one. I apologize a little bit in advance for the audio. It gets a little crackly, just a teeny bit partway through the show, and actually just kind of di- di- various portions. Uh, I'm just returning back from a great vacation fishing in Canada with my boys. That was a great Father's Day weekend, so I hope you had a nice Father's Day as well. I would recommend the Watson's Windy Point Lodge, and I'll actually put the link on my show notes page. Uh, they did a great job, and if you want great walleye and northern fishing, you can't beat the place. Very personal, very nice people, and it's a great experience for a family. Uh, we always have fun to go there every couple of years or so. Uh, I'd like to talk about the show now. Dr. Michelle Akkad is a cardiologist and internist out in California. He wrote a very interesting book called Moving Mountains, and I apologize again in the show that it takes me a, probably about a good five to ten minutes to really kind of get it, and uh, I don't know, the hamster is not running quite as fast in the cage in my mind, but it took a little bit to kind of figure out the the essence and the point of it. So today is almost a philosophical discussion of medicine, and and uh, much of medicine now, and certainly through medical training, is based on evidence-based medicine, and that means you use best practices and not an algorithmic, but oftentimes an algorithmic approach to medicine, because the focus and the emphasis on much of an education is on the population, right? So you want to keep people in general healthy, but the focus is not oftentimes on the person healthy. It seems a contradiction. However, it does come uh, it does come into play oftentimes when you're practicing. And if you're a physician, you know exactly what I mean. But how it actually affects your de- decision-making and what that means for a specific patient, well, that's sort of what we get, about, get into during the show. And so I think you'll find it interesting, uh, different. Uh, I do think that uh, when you look at individuals as opposed to patients as a population, it does shift the way you approach them. And it's certain, something that certainly seems, it's always made me feel uneasy, I guess, while I'm practicing. I don't find I have as much problems with this as maybe a, some, a, general, a generalist, a, a family practice or internist or pediatrician, just because I have more of a technical sort of practice. It's sort of like if you did heart catheterizations, for the most part, you're just doing the catheterization, finding where the blockage is and fixing it. I mean, there are obviously ways you can individualize treatment, but essentially you're more of a technician. But many physicians are more practice, practicing medicine, and that's why we call it practicing, and there's the art of medicine. And I think um, we get into, without using the word art, I think there's certainly 
the art and sort of the essence and the wisdom that comes along with practicing medicine is something that is de-emphasized in today's healthcare system. But I think it's essential uh, for patients, and I think it's what patients prefer in some way, although they may not think about it that way, nor do the physicians. But I think it's a different way of looking at how we treat people. And so anyway, without further delay, I'd like to go ahead and get into the episode. Again, this is episode 11 with Dr. Michelle Akkad on his book, The Moving Mountains. Enjoy. Welcome to The Paradox. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Larson. I'm here joined by my new friend, Dr. Michelle Akkad, who is our practicing cardiologist and internist out in California. Thank you for joining me. Thank you very much for having me on your show. And today's going to be a real interesting uh, uh, interview. As I was talking just before we went on, I really don't know where this is going to go because a lot of what we're going to talk about today is, oh, I suppose it's an unorthodox approach to medicine. And I would say that your book, which I found very interesting, was an unorthodox book about an unorthodox subject. And I think the basic premise is you had uh, Dr. Jeffrey Rose, who I certainly had never heard of him before, and he was from, I, was it the, mainly his work was in the 1960s that he sort of began his, with most of his impact? A little bit, you were correct, that's right, that's right, 1960s, he wrote, he himself wrote his own book um, uh, in 1993, so... Okay. So his career spanned maybe 40 years from the, the late 50s to the early 1990s, and then he died shortly after publishing right. the book. Right, and so, and so the, the book is a conversation between Socrates, who has been long gone in this world for a couple thousand years, right, and this Dr. Jeffrey Rose, and, and it's a discussion on Rose's, uh, I don't know if you'd say philosophy, but sort of his approach to medicine, and he was, I, I gather, more of an epidemiologist where he's looking at populations versus um, individual individual patients. Is that is that pretty accurate? That's right. I mean, uh, nowadays, I think you can't you can't really open a, a medical journal or even the the you know lay magazines without hearing about the concept of population health. It's population health this, population health that. Everybody's in favor of population health. And of course, you know, who, who's going to be against population health? But the, the term um, has actually a specific meaning. And um, you can trace it back to the theory of Jeffrey Rose, uh, who was an epi- epidemiologist. Um, he was a clinician. I, th- I don't know if he was a cardiologist or not, but I know that his early work... Uh, was in um, in cardiovascular disease epidemiology. He was part of fairly large um, and important uh, studies in the 60s and 70s. And um, uh, But then he, he elaborated a certain theory about uh, health and disease, which eventually culminated into a, a movement. And the movement has taken over um, academia and has you know caught the interest of... Uh, a lot of people, including, you know, sort of private large health systems, um, everybody espouses the idea of population health, uh, although no- nobody is really sure what it means. <laughs> and, and so uh, part of my book right. was to try to to get to the bottom of that. Right. And and so your book called Moving Mountains, uh, again, real interesting, and it, that'll be up on the show notes page, which is theparadox.com slash 011. And... Um, I guess when you look at the book, it it starts out by talk by just um, addressing, I guess the way we look at medicine. And so, right now, when you treat someone, I always joke again, and this is the same thing I said last episode. But you know, when you talk about a medication and how well it works, it essentially works at either zero percent or a hundred percent for most people, right? Sort of like your chance of getting cancer is zero or hundred percent. I don't know which it is. Right? You're either going to get it or not. I can give you averages, and so. Most of medicine, and certainly with my medical training, I graduated from medical school in 2000 uh, and finished, and I went out of private practice in 2004. And so when you look at how effective medications are or um, the you know, chance of things happening, you, I would say you, you, you translate things that are population-based, I guess you'd say, to the individual. And, and, you, and I guess the, the question is, it, it, are you... Are you looking at a different way of, of approaching patients from uh, like an individual medication or something like that? Because, you know, I'll say you have a 20% chance of getting a sore throat from my breathing tube when I, you know, I'll take it out. 
uh, you know, for a day or so. Is that not the way you you approach it, or are we talking about something entirely different? No, I think that's part of the problem. I mean, uh, I mean, are you asking me what I do myself in clinical practice? Well, I th- not not you specifically. I guess I guess the the question is the way we the way that we learn things now in medicine and uh, the way you know journals report that the treatment X is has is this is forty percent effective or whatever you know saying how does that how would medicine is that different than what it was and then um, how is how would medicine be why don't you just answer the first yes. thing? Is it different than it used to be? Did medicine have a different approach and way of looking at yes, it? Yes, I think it, it, it does. I mean, I think right now the, this emphasis on quantifying probabilities and um, risks and degrees of belief and so forth is it, all very new. Uh, I mean, it's new. I mean, uh, I'm saying in, in a relative sense. I mean, it's, it's a 20th century thing and, and, and pretty much a post-World War II um, uh, thing where all of a sudden statistical inference became extremely important and and dominates everything not just in medicine but in many other fields of uh, uh, the social sciences and so forth. So so now right. we talk about things. You know, you, you would tell a patient, and without uh, batting an eyelash, you will tell the patient you have a twenty percent chance of getting this or that. Yeah, right. But if you think right. about it, it's, it's kind of a, an incoherent, uh, you know, statement because it either is going to happen or it's not going to happen. It's either true or false. And uh, and this precise quantification uh, did not come to us naturally. It's it sort of it built in over the, the last few decades by the encroachment primarily of uh, uh, you know public public health considerations and uh, and um, the applied statistics uh, that were essentially brought into the the clinical and the bedside and the clinical arena. Um, so, you know, I, it's not actually the, f- the focus of my book, but it's 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 an important uh, uh, aspect, and and so we can spend a few minutes talking about it. So, so there is a sense in which, you know, we have we seem to have various degrees of of um, of certainty about what will happen, right. Um, mm-hmm. Right, but 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 it's a far cry from actually putting a, a number to it, okay. and and saying it's you know twenty percent or or X percent, and even that degree of certainty, you know, philosophically, if if you dig into it, um, it it's complicated exactly what that means. So I, I don't want to spend too much time on that, but right. but but there is certainly there's been a huge push uh, to have doctors embrace. Uh, this you know this whole quantification thing and and make uh, uh, calculations on the basis of percentages of uh, you know what we expect will happen and and so forth. Um, so yeah, go ahead. Is that is that more a would you say that's more a cultural societal shift in that people are I don't know if they're more educated or they just feel like they they you want to quantify the risk so that people have an expectation for what's going to happen right so. I'm going to operate on your leg and I'm going to tell you you have a very good chance that you'll have pain afterwards. And I'll say, there's a, there's a chance you get an infection. They say, well, I'm going to infection in my leg. I might have to have my leg amputated. Well, that's a very small chance. And then you have to, you feel so need to quantify that in some way to say, well, it's, it's extremely rare, but I have to tell you about all the risks is, <clears throat> is that sort of what, what you're. Yes. So the, you're right. There's a huge cultural shift and, um, and and it's very deep. It's very deep because uh, philosophically it has to do with uh, how we think about what we know, and you know it's it's about the theory of knowledge, if you will. Um, and and now we we're, we're, we seem to be reduced to thinking of knowledge in terms of uh, you know some kind of mathematical probability function. Um, right. Yeah. And, and uh, but but the, the reality, or in reality, it should be that. Uh, the surgeon is going to operate because he, th- he thinks or she thinks it's the right thing to do, right? At this moment in time, right. you know, I'm the surgeon and I think it's the right thing to do. And either the patient agrees or doesn't, you know, or disagrees. But really, there's no reason for mm-hmm. uh, mathematics to enter into uh, into the equation, if I, if, I, if I can make that pun here. Um, right. So... 
so 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 there's a, there is this sort of cultural emphasis on um, methods of quantification, and, and they have pervaded our thinking very deeply. So that now, I, you know, when I point out that it's a little bit ludicrous to to think in terms of probability and, and statistics and and how you apply the results of clinical trials and all that stuff. You know, I, I get a lot of blank stares from uh, my audience uh, because they, they can't imagine not thinking without, you know, some kind of handle on, you know, what clinical trials show, you know, what percentage of patients, you know, what's, uh, you know, what percentage of patients do what and, and so forth. Right. And so, <clears throat> and I would say uh, in looking at medicine now and sort of the way it's practiced and the way it's evolving, and I think it's just I've noticed a change since I've been on practice now for almost 14, 15 years that there is a more of an algorithm sort of based uh, method. And I know you get into this in, in the book. And so I think that sort of goes along with the numbers, right? So you say, well, I know that 20% of people, if I look at a large population, we're going to have prop going to get an infection when they have a urinary catheter let's say, or whatever, let's say it's 20%. So I think, well, if I want to minimize my risk for that, I'm going to standardize a process where I don't place them because then I'm going to decrease my risks for this. Uh, and, and so that may not actually be the best, the best treatment for that particular patient. But you know that over, on a population wide, you know that from a hospital system standpoint, or you know a healthcare system, that it's going to be better for them from a number standpoint. Even though maybe that one particular patient would benefit from having that because they can't get up to the bathroom and so they're more likely to fall or whatever. But you sort of reduce an individualized um, statistic where. Yes, if you look at everybody, there's a 20% chance of infection, but that person, maybe it's very small, and the risk for everything else is so much greater, but because you have a certain protocol in place. Correct. I, I think I think you're right. Way. I mean, essentially, it's the tension between, you know, what is a fundamentally clinical judgment, because clinical judgment is about a specific person at a given point in time under very specific circumstances. And there's really um, uh, no way to... Uh, or the population studies should be secondary um, and shouldn't dictate what you're going to do for that person or what you're going to recommend to that person uh, at any given point in time. Th they inform your judgment. You know, the, the large studies inform your judgment. But I think people are mistaken in, in uh, how the large studies actually inform judgment. For example, if there's a clinical trial... Um, mm -hmm. you know, that has enrolled, you know, thousands of patients. I think the, the information, the important information from the clinical trial is nothing more than the shared experience. Um, you know, so, so you can read the, the clinical trial um, uh, report and, and have, you know, get a sense of in general, you know, what happens to people when they're exposed to this treatment or this diagnostic test and whatnot. But the actual um, uh, outcome of the trial, whether you know, you can say that the, the drug was more effective or ineffective with a p-value of zero point zero, whatever. You know, all this all this quantification is actually irrelevant because you have you know, yeah. if say drug A is uh, superior to drug B by you know twelve percent point, you know twelve percentage and, and whatnot, that doesn't tell you what's going to happen to your patient, whether you give your patient drug A or drug B. Uh, it's almost irrelevant, but but there's information that's full in terms of you know it's essentially shared experience, and in a way, it's right. not really different from what people did before clinical trials were so popular. They would just publish large case series, and you know they, they would not be uh, you know the case series would not have precise uh, concomitant control groups and whatnot. They would have historical controls and so forth, but they were useful nevertheless, and and you can in a way mentally fill in the blanks. And um, and that's what wise clinicians would be, you know, are able to do. Uh, they can sort of uh, mentally make, uh, you know, uh, imagine what might happen to the patient uh, with one process or another, and then make a decision. And it doesn't. And 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 at at the end of the day, you never know. You never know if any particular decision is the right thing for the patient or not, because you don't have a, a parallel universe. To compare it to right to compare what you do, so whether you follow the, uh, you know, the currently preferred uh, population-based algorithms uh, <laughs> to the T, or whether you right. use your own clinical judgment and whatever reasoning you come up with, 
uh, based on your your experience and and your whatever wisdom you have and people have different uh, degrees of wisdom you know there's no way to say that one is superior you know scientifically or, or quantify quantify that one approach is better than the other um, but the difference is that the algorithm is in many ways uh, uh, inhumane <laughs> and right. And, and we sense that we, we have a strong sense of I think clinicians who uh, who try to pay attention to um, to their patients you know get a sense that that no they 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 can come up with reasons to deviate from the I mean not always I mean sometimes you, you're gonna follow the algorithm but other times you want to be able to deviate from the algorithm and um, and and you may not always be able to articulate it so the problem now is that there's a demand a constant demand on clinicians to articulate precisely, you know, why they're taking each right. step that they're taking. And that, you know, it takes an, a huge amount of time and it's distracting and it's, and, and so the path of, well, it's not accurate and it's not right? accurate. Correct. Right. Right. I mean, so essentially you're, so what you're doing is you're, you're, you're taking these large studies that are over large populations and they have these, and you're trying to hope that your patient matches <laughs> The, the average patient of the 1,000 people or so, uh, or 10,000 that might be in this large study. And you're hoping that the circumstances are similar and uh, that you can extrapolate using that study uh, the appropriate treatment. And of course, you can't make any assurances because it turns out that people are very different. Right? Correct. And I think, and, and um, I've been to a, a lot of and this is very important because I've been to a lot of meetings in the hospitals and and certainly all through medical school, I mean, you know, evidence-based medicine, at least when I was in training, that was the gold standard, right? We want to practice evidence-based medicine because we don't want to just kind of use random sort of guesses. We want to have an educated, systematic approach to, to treatment, and that's using these, these studies that match your population, mat, that your individual matches some population, right, for a particular procedure or whether, you know, disease. And so you essentially have... Uh, you're you're essentially ex extrapolating and you're and you're guessing, but the problem is is that again, no one's the same, and and I've heard at least three or four Six Sigma talks in our in um, the healthcare system and in other talks like in the large, um, especially forums where they talk about bringing airline pilots to try and streamline make the hospitals work appropriately, and that you know they talk these pilots come in they're aghast. And how we pop, how we go, they walk into an operating room, and everyone uses different instruments, and people use different uh, approaches for doing whatever. Maybe it's like putting a knee, or they use different instrument systems, and everyone has a different way of doing the anesthesia, and the nurses may do things a little bit differently as well. And so they they can't they can't believe that we have a essentially a thousand different ways of doing the same thing, right? And so they're and so they. And for someone who runs, uh, who's a pilot of a plane, you get in the, that 747, everything's exactly in the same place. All the parts are where they are in every other 747, you know, made by Boeing. And so you're into your flight checks exactly the same. And so it, you should go through, I mean, algorithm absolutely makes sense. Or if you're in a car factory, everything should be in the same place and everything runs exactly the same because every car is going to come out exactly the same, maybe just a different color or something like that. And so for, and so they've tr the healthcare systems, and this is not unique to any healthcare system that I'm aware of. They're all the same in the sense that they try and use that same process to move patients through. And I find it amazing that people are in, they're entirely capable of looking across the room and not being surprised that no one looks like them. <laughs> they're different shapes and sizes and ages, and you know some people have canes or whatever, and yet they are somehow feel that. They can use the same principles of automation with a with a mass producing you know toasters, and use that sort of thing to take care of people and and treat their illness. I mean, that's right, that's right. So the the airplane analogy you know uh, has had a lot of purchase among uh, you know health uh, healthcare policy planners and 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 so forth. To be fair, it's not entirely unreasonable. And and there may be parts of um, you know the, the process of, of healthcare that can lend themselves to 
you know, a sort of a, a, a more mechanical and regimented and algorithmic approach. Oh, absolutely. Um, Parts are, yes. So, so it's, not, it's not entirely unreasonable. Uh, but the question is, who should design the algorithms? When should they be applied? When should they be, should there be exceptions to the algorithms? How frequently should they be modified? And the problem is that for the most part, it's been a top-down approach where the people who are best uh, able to to design the algorithms and uh, implement them where they should be implemented are not uh, are rarely part of the uh, the decision process and and the algorithms are imposed <laughs> from um, you know from the outside and top down and and it's going to be the same algorithm for the entire country um, and 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 the, the the goals of implementation of the algorithms you know they they're there are conflicts of interest because it's tied to how much a hospital will get paid and that sort of thing. So there are a lot of problems with that. Right. With that, but but uh, so so it's not that you know we're, we're completely against algorithms all the time, but it's you know what algorithms when and uh, and, and who should decide. And we're we're in a healthcare system where everything is extremely centralized, where uh, there's a uh, of fragmentation and uh, of interest and conflict of interest and it's all discomb- discombobulated discombobulated and um, and imp- uh, imposed yeah. algorithms to the ce- you know seems to the central planner a way to put order into the mess but it it really doesn't it it just adds to the to the confusion uh, in, in many ways right and and i think and i think when you're if you're a hospital administrator you're looking at ways of trying to get um, to get to get a handle on how much things cost and how to move you know, throughput and inventory and I mean, there, many parts of healthcare, as you say, are are definitely useful to use algorithms. For instance, how and I'm in the operating theater, so for me, it makes sense to have a process for cleaning the room and turning over between operations. You have someone come in who mops, someone who comes in who wipes down all the cables. Someone who makes sure all the medications are the right place. Someone brings new case carts in, take the old case carts out, and gets all that stuff set up. I mean, that is a very – it can be easily regimented and automated sort of process. It's just when it comes to the patient who lays on the table, I guarantee that patient who lays on the table is nothing like the patient before. I mean, they probably have four limbs, but it, but outside of that, it could be entirely different. Right. And so you can't expect to have that process be the same, right? You wouldn't come in if you have bring in a Toyota – and you change the oil, and the next car that comes in is like a Tesla. Well, it doesn't even have oil, right? I mean, you can't treat Correct. it the same way. And so the expectation that, that things are the same is yeah. inappropriate and, and, in that sense. However, there are parts right. that the algorithm and, works. And you want, you want the, uh, you know, the, the, the clinicians and the, the healthcare um, uh, workers who are closest to the patient, you want them to be able to uh, to decide and, and not be so preoccupied at – following the algorithms because there's now it's there's been so much emphasis on following the algorithm that it's become a huge distraction and it's become the primary focus uh, of many doctors and healthcare workers is, is just you know following the routine because you know somebody somebody's watching and and uh, the, the quality standards are going to be reflected on whether you check all the boxes and 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 do things in a, in a very right. algorithmic way and so forth, but the whole thing fundamentally the 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 the, the, the big um, the fundamental problem is that in, in our healthcare system and in all healthcare you know large Western healthcare systems, uh, it, it's been the case for the last fifty, sixty years, seventy years that the patient is. Um, I mean, to me, it's an economic problem or a socioeconomic problem is that the the you, uh, paying for healthcare, you know, the financing of the healthcare system is done by third parties, whether it's the government or large um, um, insurance companies that are in many ways sponsored right. by government programs mm-hmm. and or, or subsidized and, and so forth. So you have this, uh, this uh, situation where you have... Um, the clinicians, the hospitals, being paid for by an entity that is not ultimately the patient, or that is not ultimately the the person receiving the care, and and so it's there's an inherent conflict of interest, and this 
population-based management system that includes algorithms, it includes guidelines, it includes all the things, you know, things that I talk about in the book, um, is the natural consequence of this arrangement um, of, of third parties paying for the care of the population at large and, and wanting to manage how the system is run. And, um, and, and, and so that's, uh, that's the reason why. And, and on, until that changes, I don't think you, you, you're able to, to, to correct that uh, because, you know, if, if now we, we um, care is, provi- you know, is financed primarily, say, by insurance companies or primarily by the government or whatnot, it, it stands to reason that the insurance company and the government uh, want to have a say in how the money is being spent. Right, uh, yeah. But the problem is that they are not doctors and they're not there at the time that the care is being given. They're not, they can't have a spy in each operating room or, or a representative <laughs> in every uh, uh, examination room in the doctor's office. And therefore, the, the, the only way they can, uh, you know, have a, get a handle on the situation is to impose, you know, algorithms and impose, uh, you know, population-based philosophies on, on, on how care should be uh, uh, dispersed. And, and that's what we see. Right. And so, I mean, to the first part of your point, when you talk about checking, clicking boxes, that absolutely is um, synonymous with an electronic health record, right? So you have these these records in it. And so the way to try and make sure everything's been done properly and to document it is you have, you have to have some sort of algorithm so that you actually complete the different tasks that are involved. Uh, so that is so the the electronic health record is in, in many ways is is creating is almost forcing algorithms or algorithmic approach to medicine in a non individualized treatment pattern. And then your point about the third party payers essentially is that if I have a house and I um, if I'm the the government, let's just say, and I want to make sure the houses don't burn down. I want to make sure I get the small percentage of houses burned down, so I, so I centralize my fire station by where the largest population is, right? But if you live way out of the country, I'm not as worried about you because you're only one house. And and although for you that is everything, right? And so you want to make sure that you absolutely have fire coverage and and your houses are burned down. So your your um, incentive is not going to match and align with the governments because the or the third party the person paying for it because they want it they're of they're looking at the population as a whole and so they're minimizing their, their overall fire risk and if you're way on the end well you're just kind of out of luck because you're a small percentage of right and so that's sort of the way way of looking that's at right. it maybe. and that's a, and that's really in the best case scenario because to say that they're interested in the 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 population as, as a whole uh, perhaps gives them a little too much credit. I mean, for the most part, you know, uh, politicians are interested in getting reelected. That that's, that's their primary uh, interest. You know, bu- bureaucrats are interested in um, keeping their job and not having their agency be in the newspaper. Then you know, one day because there's some kind of a uh, you know a scandal or something, and so they're going to be extremely conservative and just do what they've been doing for the last twenty years, and. Um, and and plus they have no knowledge of really of what what happens uh, uh, on the scene, and so they they apply these uh, statistical methods and this uh, utilitarian calculus, uh, but it's it really doesn't work. I mean they even if they can, you know, do some kind of study to give them a a rough guide as to what would optimize uh, outcomes in a certain way, the nature of medicine and medical care and healthcare is such is so dynamic intrinsically that. You know, by the time they apply the, the the guidelines derived from these studies, things have changed, and and you have no confidence in the fact that even if the guidelines and the algorithms were applied perfectly, that would actually maximize anything. You know, uh, and it right. probably yeah. wouldn't. You know, in, in uh, everybody, you know, I think everybody knows that, but nobody's uh, willing to admit it. Well, and you, I mean, you've seen this you know, when it comes to beta blockade, and you, and for a while, everyone was. They're using beta blockers, which is a medication that's used to slow the heart rate and um, is found to have a protective effect on the heart. And so their large studies were placed, and they showed that there was a benefit to people who um, uh, to stay in beta blockers. And so they, and then what happened is people extrapolated and said, well, well, everybody should be in beta blockers before surgery. So they started piling all these beta blockers on these different people, these medications, and then find, they find out later on that, of course, this causes instant, increased incidence of stroke and other problems. And what's more interesting, of course, is that 
after about five or six years of people knowing this, the government and the, I don't know if it's CMS, but all the different healthcare systems, they all, and insurance companies, that one of their markers for quality was that you make sure people are in beta blockers. Right. right? And then, right. But then by the time they have it imposed, it's, about, it's been imposed for maybe just a couple of years and they're starting to, to reward or penalize uh, healthcare systems for having high or low numbers of people on beta blockers. Then they decide, discover that it's, it's, it's disadvantageous to be on them. And it takes them years to get it off, right? And so they, yeah. So you, the, like to your point, the the dynamism of of sort of healthcare and the new medications techniques. Uh, and not only not only that, but then they they don't even suffer the you know they they're not themselves penalized for uh, you know having well, imposed right. the wrong policy <laughs> that has you know hurt you know possibly countless uh, uh, hapless patients uh, doctors. Uh, they they suffer no consequence and and they keep doing what they what they've been doing all along you know they, they'll try something else um, with a equally low probability of of uh, really being uh, on target with anything yeah you're not going to switch to a different CMS right <laughs> you're kind of there's only one center for right. medical services um, and so this kind of goes into the uh, I guess the, the so this is the philosophical question now if you are maybe not philosophical is the wrong word but so if I'm treating a patient. And, um, and I want to use a, an approach different than what's used now. So would it be sort of like me going to the car uh, to get my car fixed and going to the mechanic and he said, well, it's about a 40% chance this carburetor is going to get you fixed. And, you know, there's a good chance this car's, but you know, maybe about a 75% chance this thing's going to run okay for the next, you know, six months versus going and just saying, we think this is wrong. This is wrong. This needs to be fixed. I've looked over the car. Because no one ever gets percentages in anything else. I mean, you don't go and go to get your get a cake made, and they say, "Well, it's about an eighty five percent chance for right. the icing right, and I think <laughs> our lettering will be good. Our spelling's really good, so about a ninety eight percent chance of spelling being proper." I mean, you right. And what's the risk products, of eating too much sugar? Right. right. Yeah, the sugar yeah, to the fat. A chance of too much sugar, hundred <laughs> percent. But, but um, it, and so there aren't many parts of life where actually. I mean. It, when I in reading your book, and not, not until I sort of talking about now, does it sort of make sense to me that your your point really is that there aren't many places in life where you are, almost expect to have these sorts of probabilities tossed around. Except I, that's I guess because of I guess because it probably part of the, partly the nature of of how healthcare is paid for and delivered, and because you have very large impersonal uh, organizations that are looking over you. So yes, uh, Eric, the, the keyword is impersonal because uh, in this system where you have third parties involved, whether it's the payers or the regulators or the government or whatnot, and all these third parties view things on a population um, or from a population perspective, and they don't really care uh, individually about any given patient or any specific patient, uh, this arrangement here uh, changes the nature of of, uh, uh, of the medical relationship because the medical relationship really ultimately is about a doctor caring uh, for and caring about another uh, individual person, right? And 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 therefore the decision. You know, when when you as a doctor you you make a decision, it's you think that for patient X, you know, or, or Mrs. Jones or Mr. Brown in front of you, that's going to be in his or her best interest. Okay. And that has been distorted. Right. And now what, what happens now, we're, we're training and we're being trained and that includes me and you and, you know, people who have been uh, in practice for the last 30, 40 years, or probably even more in my, my opinion. I mean, that's been sort of ongoing for, for, for a long time. We've, we've turned the doctor into a sort of an expert technician, so, so now there's a detachment from the patient and you're the expert and you're going to apply the wizardry of uh, statistical probabilities and, and prognostication mm -hmm. and so forth in order to make a decision. Uh, but that's really contrary to the nature of, 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 of what medicine is about. Um, and, um, and, uh, and, and, and people are confused, uh, I think, about that. And, and well-meaning people are confused. And people who go into medicine for the right reason, um, thinking that it's going to be a, you know, that it's a pre profession really about personal relationship, uh, end up discovering that it's become a, a, a technical profession um, about applying these algorithms and these population-based considerations. 
uh, to patients in a very impersonal level. Now, of course, many people try to do the best that they can and intuitively still hang on to the, the correct notion of what medicine is about. But there's clearly a, a conflict. It, it puts everybody in a conflict. Right. Um, yeah, and, and you hear... And so, I mean, part of the... Part of the nature, I imagine, is because you have people with less technical skills. That they're trying to deliver healthcare, right? I mean, I think this this comes to the right. To the mid that's level right. That's, that's and, right. And I, I mean, that's, I don't want to get into that too much, but I feel when it comes to, I, certainly, I've talked to a number of physicians. We'll talk about this in just a moment. But it, I've talked to some direct primary care physicians, and and they're when, the ones who were in pre- previous healthcare systems. They definitely have that assembly line, um, a mill sort of feel to it that they're judged on the, the referral rates, how much they use utilizes imaging and they utilize uh, uh, laboratories and referrals within the healthcare systems network and that they're not judged on how well their patients do because it's more on how they utilize resources or there are a lot of other things pulling them in different directions that are, that are not in the interest of the patient. I mean, they may not necessarily be against the patient's wishes or like detrimental to them, but certainly that they have a lot of other things pulling them besides that person sitting in front of them. And that's not why many of us got yes. into medicine to begin yes. with, right? Is that Norman Rockwell pipe Correct. painting? Correct. And, and you're right that people will, say, will will make the claim that, you know, I mean, you have to standardize because, uh, you know, there were a lot of, of uh, doctors who were not technically proficient before. But the truth is, um, is that, it, it, technical proficiency can never never be a, a good substitute for for genuinely caring doctors, and right. and the doctors who are genuinely ca- genuinely caring will actually go ahead and gain the technical proficiency and implement the algorithm when they see that it's the right thing to do, and you know uh, maintain good records when they see that it's, they see that it's the right thing to do. You know, my favorite example, and it goes way back, but it, my favorite example is the example of the Mayo Clinic. Uh, I've studied the, uh, the early history of the Mayo Clinic and believe it or not, uh, the founder of the Mayo Clinic, the, the, you know, didn't have any license to speak of, you know, whether it's the, the father Mayo or the, his two sons, the brothers Mayo, but they were, you know, they were motivated by, the, the care for their patients and the care for the profession. And therefore, they went to school. They got all the degrees that were necessary. They kept up to date. They implemented uh, the medical record. Really, the, the modern medical record uh, was invented at the Mayo Clinic. And the Mayo Clinic had all kinds of um, processes, sort of uh, regimented processes so as to run smoothly. Right, but these were not imposed from the outside by by mm-hmm. third party regulators. They were designed by the doctors who cared, who uh, you know saw saw what the, what the best way of of of, uh, of running things was. They implemented it accordingly, and and they were rewarded by the patients. The patients could recognize that this was a, the better care, and and they they got rewarded, and and the the Mayo Clinic became very very successful before there was any kind of third party intention to quote unquote ensure that everybody's you know competent and with this uh, illusion that you can ensure the, the the competency of doctors by imposing uh, technical proficiency exams whether it's uh, you know board certifications or whatnot or yes. that you can imp- yeah. and, and when that fails then then you resort to algorithms and when that fails, you resort to I don't know what you resort. You resort to to we'll find uh, out. to replacing to replacing doctors with uh, you know robots or 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 non doctors who are more willing or more more malleable and more willing to follow algorithms or and, and that's the trend. That's the trend that I'm seeing is that there's a um, uh, to some extent. I mean, there, I think there's an ongoing uh, 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 there's an awakening right now among doctors and a and a healthy rebellion against all of that, but. Um, but we need to be very vigilant because that's the logic of the of the system, the logic of the central planners and the third party payers and the the, the regulators, is that they, they only see uh, processes and they only focus on the uh, a certain idea of, of population health and um, and and it's very unhealthy, uh, as I say, population health is very unhealthy. So, so how would you counter someone who says to you, well? That's all. I mean, I understand you want to treat people as individuals and, you know, you do your best you can within a system. But how do you how do you square the fact that people need screening? Right. So 
how do you figure out who you recommend to have colonoscopies and uh, PSAs and uh, mammograms? How do you decide on that sort of thing if you are treating not populations, but you're just treating individuals? How how would you counter that per, that argument? Right. So you, you, it doesn't discount, uh, you treat individuals, but you don't discount the value of, of uh, population-based studies. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't do population-based studies and, and learn f- from those studies. But... But the, the 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 focus should not be the population, the health of the population. The focus should always be the the, the health of the individual. And it's interesting that um, right now we live in an age where we can't think of doing a population health studies without having big government programs and whatnot. But something that people don't really know is that um, hypertension, the 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 idea that high blood pressure is bad for you was discovered not by academic running large public health uh, or epidemiologic studies. It was actually discovered by the private, sec- private sector. It was discovered by life insurance companies um, in the 1920s and 1930s. Um, and in those days, people, you know, doctors uh, knew very little about blood pressure. The, the devices to measure the blood pressure accurately had just been, you know, designed and invented but there was no application for them, and therefore the doctors were really not interested in measuring anybody's blood pressure. But the insurance companies got, got wind of that and thought, hmm, uh, you know, uh, they started to, to wonder if having a high blood pressure, you know, had any significance for the future. So they enrolled doctors and they gave them, they taught them how to measure the blood pressure. They gave them uh, blood pressure, you know, manometers. And, and they are the ones who collected the, the data privately. Uh, that determines that yes, having a high pressure baseline, you know, gives you you know a higher chance of having uh, mm-hmm. uh, poor outcomes in the future, and uh, and so all that was done sort of uh, organically, and uh, and and then the you know the the, the medical community em- embraced that uh, knowledge, and and applied it, and so so uh, we're not discounting the value of population studies, but we're what, what we want to refrain from uh, uh, getting into is is changing our focus from the patient in front of us, the patient to whom we should be, uh, or about whom we should be caring and for whom we should be caring, and to substitute for that uh, uh, individual attention, the attention to uh, the broader population. Right. Which is never productive. It's always counterproductive. You know, if you take care of every individual, the population will become healthy. <laughs> but the converse is not true. And the converse is what they, you know, the people who push the population health agendas want you to believe. They say, no, 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 no. Pay, you know, work on these population-based norms, and then your patients will be will become healthy. But that 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 doesn't make sense, and it's and it's uh, it, it's flatly false. Yeah, and so uh, you worked for. We're not going to talk about any specific healthcare system, but you worked for a large healthcare system at some point, and then I've had a couple direct primary care physicians, and I'm, I found your story a little bit more unusual in that you are um, a specialist, and so. I, you know, I talked to one of the physicians. He said it should be called direct patient care, not direct primary care, because he believes that we are moving towards, oh, uh, more, a system with more of a sort of, I guess, a normal transaction within a market uh, where you just have the patient pay you for whatever the services that they are requiring, whether it's a membership-based fee like for most of the direct primary care or a, um, a one-time fee for someone who's a specialist you might only see once in your life or maybe on a rare occasion, right? So... Y- can you just briefly go into, I guess, how you ended up in direct primary care as a cardiologist and what that practice looks like as a specialist and how, and then third part, how do you treat patients differently than you did um, than you did before when you were within the large health system? Right, yeah. So uh, I practice both. Uh, so I do, and, and, and uh, the point that your, your friend was making is, is uh, absolutely um, uh, perfect. It should be... Uh, direct patient care, and I call my cardiology practice direct cardiology care, and I call my primary care practice direct patient, you know, direct primary care. So, 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 yeah. uh, yes, that's right. And and um, so I, I have a primary care practice um, that follows the um, the DPC model, the direct primary care model. It's a it's a reasonable monthly membership fee, and um, and. Because the, the membership fee, it it seems uh, primary care seems to lend itself um, better uh, uh, to a membership model, and then I have a cardiology and outpatient cardiology practice where people uh, come and find me um, 
uh, right now most of them find me uh, you know on their own uh, online i have a i think a nice website the the practice is called the uh, athletic heart of san francisco i try to make it sort of appealing and upbeat as opposed to calling it you know the center for cardiovascular <laughs> disease and failure <laughs> and whatnot you're dying but, please come see right you exactly but what they find with me is that um Number one, I'm readily available because I'm not congested. They don't have to wait three or six weeks to, to see to see me. They can see me usually within within a few days for a cardiology consultation. I speak with them on the phone before they make an appointment, before they actually book an appointment, just to make sure that I understand their needs and that I can prepare the visit. Uh, after a brief phone call, if we decide to go ahead and have a visit, if I anticipate that they will need tests, then they will have their consultation and their uh, non-invasive test in one fell swoop and in a matter of two hours they can leave my office with a diagnosis the test done the recommendations and all of this which otherwise would take them you know weeks and weeks to <laughs> to obtain uh, and not only that my cash fees tend to be extremely competitive for patients yeah. who have high deductible insurance and so if, uh, if they have a high deductible and they have the misfortune of going to the university hospital to get their ultrasound it, it can it can be ruinous, whereas here it's you know it's reasonable and most of them find it very reasonable, and I tend to bundle my my services into into packages of of, of commonly obtained tests so that if they come and they have a, a consult, consultation an echo an EKG a, and a stress test it's sort of bundled into one very uh, affordable fee, and so so people find very, uh, that very advantageous and and they come even if they have insurance because it's. It's better than going within network. Sure. Um, so my my challenge is to to, to market that because you know it, it, you can't have it's very expensive to have you know advertising campaigns and and yeah. and so forth when people only need a cardiologist you know rarely and and punctually. So so it takes a long long time to to ramp up the 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 awareness of my practice. Right. But it's happening. So how uh, how shocked are people when they when they talk to you? That they're actually talking to a doctor who called right. who called them <laughs> people are visiting right. a cardiologist. Most no of them are, are ext- right. Most of them are extremely you know grateful and uh, and it immediately gives a sense of trust that yeah. you know the doctor is willing to talk to the patients you know before they even show up. Do, do they believe and, it's really a doctor or do they think it's a recording? It when they, yeah, no, when I they think they do it. because they, they you know they've been on my website and my website okay, so you know they I have a blog and a, and a video and whatnot. So I, I I'm I'm very. Um, Patient oriented in that way, and that you know to answer your third question, I think that's the the main the main difference is that it's not that I'm smarter or a better clinician or than than those who practice um, you know in in the system or, or within big box medicine, but I have the time, the freedom to focus my attention appropriately, and um, and and so and so I can do that. I don't have all of the distractions that my colleagues have of having to deal with. Uh, you know, uh, paperwork to get paid, you know, to justify the, the consultation, right. paperwork to uh, to show that you've provided quality care, uh, notes that have all kinds of, uh, <laughs> that are unreadable, really, right. clinical oh, notes yeah. that are unreadable because they contain so much uh, garbage. And uh, so I, 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 I can do this. And then sometimes some patients, I can t- immediately dismiss them if I don't think they have a cardiac problem. I can tell them very quickly, right, that I don't need to justify doing all kinds of stuff uh, that that's unnecessary. Uh, I can so so if if a patient needs a lot of attention, I can spend the time, and if they don't need a lot of attention, then I can tailor my my consultation that way. Right. And so, how long have you been doing that? Uh, it's been about four years. Okay. So you're still solvent. So that's a good four sign years. that it's that it's working for right. you. Right. Right. It's, so. it's arduous. I mean, I, I don't want to minimize the uh, the, the difficulties. Um, sure. And and so, but but I would never trade this back to to. to I mean, and clearly, I'm not doing as as I mean, financially. It's it's absolutely a negative compared to what I was doing before. Uh, you know, in the from system, from a financial standpoint, right? From a financial standpoint, it, it's a, it's a big uh, yeah. big loss, but it's a loss that I was willing to to incur uh, in exchange for you know peace of mind and and sort of uh, sanity and lack of burnout and that sort of thing. Well, right. I mean, because there is a cost to for for you in, for you mentally, right, and spiritually, to have to do all that extra paperwork at the end of the day and to do things that you think are not helpful to your to your practice and certainly to I your think patients. So. And so, there's a lot of busy work, right? And so there's a there's a cost, and so you, that you trade off extra pay 
you're kind of getting paid for doing stuff that was not helpful. It was it was harmful. I think so. I think so. And I think it's you know it's reflected in the in this uh, epidemic of uh, physician burnout that we uh, uh, we hear about and we experience uh, either in ourselves or in our colleagues. I mean, I was kind of unhappy when I was. Uh, yeah. Um, not not particularly. I mean, I was paid well and I was doing fun stuff. I was doing a lot of cardiac procedures and so forth. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I was always, uh, you know, triggered by you know uh, stuff that seemed to be out of my control that I wanted to do in a different way and that I, I couldn't. I had I felt helpless. Yeah. And um, so well, you know, we discuss when I in episode eight where I, I discussed with Dr. Dearman, we talked about physician burnout and suicide and the threat of malpractice and. I was surprised to find that the physician, that the amount, the number, percentage of physicians in, who are contemplating suicide within any one year, within any one year, is seven percent. And I found that really stunning. And you know, we have almost four hundred physician suicides per year. And I won't say there's one thing that leads to this. It's probably you know many things, like everything. But uh, you know, I think we undervalue sometimes personally our what we do, what we have to deal with personally. So it's great that you found a spot that you're doing what you you're practicing the way you like to practice and that you think you're doing a good job. And, and it, and that's, that's probably worth a lot more than probably you even give yourself credit to for Thank a you. times. Yeah. Um, so again, the, the book is moving mountains and that'll be linked on this show notes page. And are there any other ways people can find you that you'd like? Yes. Uh, if there are, uh, you know, doctors or, or health care professionals or people who are in the field who are interested in, um, my blog, uh, it's called alertandoriented.com, and I blog regularly. Okay. And um, with a colleague of mine, we've recently uh, started doing uh, a series of um, video blogs, and we'll start probably moving to a podcast format as well uh, in the next few weeks. But that will be linked to on my blog, so alertandoriented.com. And the book itself can be found at uh, okay. movingmountainsthebook.com. That's the landing page for... For the book, if people want to, uh, you know, find out a little bit more what the book the book is about. Great, and it, it is actually a very fun book to read. You don't have to have much medical knowledge to understand the book. I mean, if you have some, it I think gives you a little extra insight at, at points. But uh, you know, as someone who has been practicing for a while, I I was unaware of most of the things that were mentioned in that book. I mean, outside of the way medicine is practiced, but certainly the history and and it's a fun a fun sort of walk through and imagine what it's like if you hung out with Socrates right. for a while. So. My, my interest was actually was to try to attack the population, the population health movement at its, um, um, at its scientific base, or, you know, the scientific claims that, that they're making. So I wanted to, to get to the bottom of it. Right. Uh, but you're right. I tried to make it, to keep it accessible. And it's in a, the whole book is in a dialogue format. It's a quick read too. I mean, it's, uh, I think it's a hundred and some pages, but they're very, it's a very fast read. You can read all of it within a couple hours, I think. Um, so again, I would highly recommend the book. Dr. Mich- Michelle Akkad, thank you so much for being uh, spending the afternoon or evening with me, I guess. Depends where you are in the which coast. And uh, hope to talk to you soon. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to The Paradox. If you like what the doc is doing, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher and share the show with your friends. Become a supporting listener to get access to special bonuses at patreon.com forward slash the paradox. Show notes can be found at theparadox.com. get my goals once a week and uh oh, it's it's tough for me to schedule an hour a week you think that would be simple but kids and it's uh, trying to get other doctors oh, i'm sure to schedule matches <laughs> it's, been, it's, it's been, been fun the nice thing is you direct primary care guys you're a lot easier you kind of have a nice right schedule. <laughs> yeah it's, really, it's been they, i go they like oh yeah i'll just mark off an hour i'll just we'll just talk right. like, what you can do that so, yeah whatever <laughs> Right. Great. Do you have much? Of a, I didn't even ask you. Do you have much staff at your practice? One person, one full time, uh, and she's she's my, my secretary, uh, and she's she's very good. She's a mature person, and she's not a medical trained person, which I wanted. I wanted somebody who could speak to patients, and as a person, mm-hmm. and not somebody trained in the as a medical assistant who's used to, uh, you know, to the to the right. assembly line uh, approach. 
And, uh, and then I have an, uh, an ultrasound uh, uh, tech who comes okay. at, I was on an as needed that. basis. Yeah. So she comes whenever I need um, to do an echo. Um, I was trying to figure out how you did echoes by yourself, but the, moving all those knobs and stuff and taking pictures. Right. So, some some cardiologists know how to do that. I'm, I'm pretty pitiful and, and you, we're always better off with a, <laughs> with a technician and she's, she's very good. And she comes, um, uh, you know, once a week or whenever, whenever it's needed.